two of her projects, Harbor View Plaza and the Uptown Crossing Pocket Park, won 2020 Mayor's Design Awards. Jennifer's interests focus on urban design, landscape history and contemporary theory, urban ecology, visual communication and digital media in comprehensive and technical site design. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Jennifer. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining me tonight um, for the spring lecture series, Friends of Villa Terrace. Uh, this is the fifth lecture, I believe, um, in our really great series this year. Um, and tonight, I want to share with you some ideas about um, Italian Renaissance garden design. We're going to look at two gardens um, specifically from Italy in um, 16th century, the Villa d'Este and the Villa Lante, and then look at our own Villa Terrace to understand where the design inspiration for our garden here in Milwaukee came from, kind of comparing it to these um, two Italian gardens, which are really sort of exemplary of um, the Italian Renaissance. And so gardens like art and architecture tell us a lot about what's happening when, as much as they offer clues into environmental conditions and philosophical ideas of any time, we can see them as also being shaped by these same conditions. And they serve us like any cultural relic um, to kind of show expressions of the conditions and the ideas of any given time. And so looking at Renaissance Italy to kind of understand what was happening, you know, a brief background about what was happening um, with the climate, with um, social history, philosophy at the time, um, and to, to give us an understanding of how these gardens came to be as expressions of these ideas. Um, generally, Italy was a pretty um, topographically irregular and climatically irregular climate. There were, you know, cold air coming down from the Alps in the north, um, and then kind of tropical air coming up from the south. So these mild winters, um, but hot, hot summers. And there were three basic zones, um, the zone around the north, around Venice, which was a lot of lakes, a lot of lagoons, Tuscany with a lot of hills and valleys and um, the sort of patchwork kind of farm condition that still exists today. And then the area around Rome, which was mostly marshland um, and kind of cities were being built up around the um, uh, around and on top of all of the classical ruins. And so there was a lot of water in Italy everywhere and Rome where a lot of these gardens kind of sprung up or the area around Rome where a lot of these gardens sprung up, the water was really active and really abundant. And that comes into play in the um, garden designs. And so social history, I guess, um, you can think of Italy as sort of kind of emerging from the dark ages. And it was a series of all these independent states. Like you can see on this map of Renaissance Italy, there's all of these different regions and each one of them was ruled um, by uh, a different prince. Um, some of them had allegiance to the papacy, some to Rome, um, and they were kind of always feuding amongst each other. But um, at this time, because of this sort of pushback against the papacy that was happening across the area, there was um, new freedom of thought, which was kind of you know, a, a big turn from what was happening in the medieval ages that just preceded this. And so the idea of the Renaissance thinker or um, the individual thinker first emerged in um, Florence. And this is where there was a family called the Medici family and they gained control of that region. Um, and they really had a lot of influence over the arts and um, there's this region because of the Medici family is sort of thought as um, or looked at as being the place where like ele this elegant mercantile class sort of rose up. And so um, we don't know the exact impetus of um, the Renaissance, but a lot of scholars believe that there was a lot of economic instability that was coming out of the Middle Ages and there weren't a lot of investment opportunities. So wealthy families like the Medici family um, decided to, um, or had the liberty, I guess, to sort of fund arts. And this was really, um, you know, this had a really profound influence on painting, sculpture, architecture, all of these works that we are all familiar with as coming out um, at the time. 
And there was also um, in the 15th century, which followed, there was this sort of renewed interest in um, classical ideas and studying of humanities. And this started to dominate intellectual life. And, and even though there was pushback against um, you know, the, Roman, the Roman church or the papacy, these humanities didn't really, um, they weren't really considered to be incompatible with the things that the church were teaching. So they were kind of, it became commonplace um, and really accepted to start to look, to start to, you know, reconsider um, rationalism and empiricism um, instead of, or alongside, you know, these established doctrines of faith that had been sort of driving the region previously. Um, and so there was this, like I said, this sort of freedom of thinking um, and ideas weren't solely dominated by the church as they had been before. And so when we look at the expression in art and in architecture, in music and other fine arts, um, the, general, the general thought is that um, there was this, you know, the eye that had previously looked inward um, or actually upward towards an eternal world and now looked out more upon the physical world. Um, there was a general artistic expression that was changing twor toward worldliness. The view of the world was expanding um, and there were lots of, kind of scientific discoveries ideas of the universe that hadn't existed before. And these new ideas and this expanding worldview were definitely reflected in the way um, that gardens were designed. Villa houses, like we're familiar with, um, they started to extend themselves towards the open air and outward um, in the medieval times, which preceded this. Um, houses kind of looked inward, um, cloister-like, you, you can imagine, with sort of the view up um, towards the heavens. And so um, with these new ideas in the Renaissance, the houses started to open up and expand to views beyond um, the, the actual garden or the edges of the property, there was not a real negotiation yet with nature in terms of letting nature into the garden, but this is this is definitely um, kind of ex an expanded view of looking out towards nature and trying to sort of, um, you know, negotiate that relationship and, and understand the boundaries. The boundaries are still quite clear, but, but looking out towards the world. And these new sort of, or these return to classical studies um, and this sort of awakening of the intellectual mind, I guess, um, shows that people were searching for order and tranquility. And this is kind of expressed in the garden um, directly as we see. So proportions in the garden were absolute. They were really stable. Um, they were finite, reflecting these, this kind of search for perfection and also these forms really bring a sense of peace. Um, there's a lot of um, symmetry or near symmetry in these gardens, but still within them, there's a sense of variety, a sense of flexibility, um, a sense of irregularity. And because the ideas were shifting sort of outward toward you know, the, the greater world around, there was attention given to um, psychological dimensions of a garden, which we haven't seen before, like the way that it feels to be in a specific space. Um, and these are really, because of that, kind of um, gardens that give us a lot in one view, but as we travel through them, there are lots of hidden small, se hidden small secret spaces, um, you know, an element of theatrics and these sort of, like I said, psychological, psychological dimensions and dimensions of a person within this really large space. And because of the climate, um, the sites were often on hillsides. So we have terraces that are carved out of the ground um, and then long routes within the garden that offer places for contemplation. And typically when we look at these gardens now, we see or we think of evergreens, um, and stones and water. And these are the structural materials that are actually, you know, sort of the permanent skeleton of the garden. But um, when these gardens were discovered by English explorers a few centuries after being built, um, a lot of the flowers and the sort of seasonality of the gardens had, had long since 
passed away. And so the kind of initial idea that we saw was these green stone kind of structured gardens, but really during the period of greatest opulence, the gardens were full of exotic plants, full of color, full of, full of fragrance. There were herbs and tulips and figs and lots of fruit and even roses. And this image shows um, one of the um, catalogs, botanic catalogs of plants in Renaissance Italy. This is about 1560, I believe that this image was made. So we can see that the sort of really, you know, green kind of hardscape idea that we sometimes see in the gardens um, doesn't reflect the true kind of um, seasonality and color and abundance that was happening in the gardens at the time. And there was, um, with this sort of return to humanities thinking, there was this um, study and classification of nature. Um, and, you know, um, this is where we start to see the physic gardens and the, the pharmacy gardens, pharmaceutical gardens. There was a big push to collect, grow, catalog, study, and dry plants. And plant collecting really grew into a hobby around this time and continued really strongly through the 16th and 17th century. And some of the grandeur and the opulence of the time um, can be attributed to this idea of paragone. Um, and this is a word that means comparison. There was a debate ongoing in the Italian Renaissance between some of the fine artists um, about which form of art, was it architecture, was it sculpture, was it painting? was champion or superior to all of the others. Um, da Vinci wrote this treatise on painting, noting the difficulty of painting and the supremacy of sight that was required to be a good painter. Michelangelo um, wrote his um, saying that sculpture was the um, superior form of art at the same time. And this idea of competition or this comparison of fine arts extended to music, to poetry, to garden making. The ability of any art to capture nature was considered the end all be all of artistic productions. So there is no art delivered to mankind that hath not the works of nature for his principal object. And we'll see this as we go through the gardens. So the first, <clears throat> sorry, the first garden that I'd like to share with you is Villa d'Este. Like other superb manor gardens, Villa d'Este is the product of a really passionate obsession on the part of the owner who was willing to spend extraordinary amounts of money um, and had the ability to hire some really great design talent, talent. In 1550, the Cardinal of Ferrara, Mr. D'Este, was appointed governor of Tivoli, which is a summer resort just outside of Rome. Um, and there was a palace there, which was part of an old monastery. So he hired architect, painter, archeologist, and garden designer, um, Piero Ligorio, to oversee the renovation of the palace and the gardens. And this structure, uh, this construction of these gardens went on for 22 years and it stopped abruptly when the Cardinal died. Um, but this garden here, Villa d'Este, is considered probably the most spectacular, the most opulent, the most sumptuous of the high um, Roman Renaissance gardens. It has these humanist themes that are woven throughout the garden, ideas of the abundance of nature, the generosity of nature. There's a lot of negotiation of um, people, the human to nature, and also negotiations between people and art. Um, and this is a really prime example of the really intricate spatial qualities of Renaissance garden design. The garden is very programmatic. It's meant to be experienced in a sequence. Um, and so, like I said, this is Tivoli, um, about 20 miles outside of Rome. But the reason that this garden is where it is, um, is because it's very adjacent to, very close to the river um, Agnene. And this is a river that has these really, a lot of water, cascading falls that are kind of spilling dramatically on their way to Rome, you can see on the side. And the water was diverted from the river and brought to um, brought to this garden at a flow of 500 liters per second to the, the sort of workings of the garden, which are called the great hydraulic machine. And if you look at this, um, this um, 
image of the kind of hydrology, the inner working of the garden, you'll see why it's called the hydraulic machine. There's um, 51 fountains and nymphaeums. There's 398 spouts, 364 jets, 64 waterfalls, 220 basins, and over a half of a mile of water chains and channels. This is made, it's brought from the river on Yene and um, in kind of an aqueduct and this really intricate network of tunnels, canals, and underground tubes is all run by the force of gravity. Um, at this time, there's no pumps, there's no automation, there's no recirculating system. This is all the work of gravity bringing this water from the river via canal to this garden um, and kind of powering these amazing, um, really over the top fountains that we'll see. All of the gardens have a source fountain. Um, Villa Lante will see, Villa Terrace is the same. The place where the water enters the garden for the for first time. And there's usually a story about, you know, what's happening at the source fountain and what that means. Here, the water enters through a grotto into this, um, which is called the Oval Fountain of Tivoli. This is the place where the water from Anyene River first appears. Um, this is, really conceived as a stage for aquatic shows that water is animated into a variety of shapes. There's artificial mountains, grottos, um, there's little niches carved into the side of this fountain that has um, stuccoed water creatures which are holding vases and each of the vases shoots out water. The water in, in this fountain and a lot of the other fountains um, actually holds a shape. Some of them actually come out and are sort of vase-shaped. Some of the fountains spray out and are shaped like seashells, um, again, all by, all by gravity. Um, and this kind of thunders down out of the grotto or out of the mountainside through this dish, the crater-shaped dish, um, and the water on top sprays out into the shape of a lily. So there's an artificial mountain at the top and there has these sort of terracotta kind of fissures built in and the water drips through these fissures, um, purposeful fissures to create this growth of vegetation, this purposeful growth of vegetation. And then there's the three grottos at the bottom that you can see behind this big fountain um, that are filled with statues. And then all of this water sort of channels into an upper walkway. And the image on the right, you can see the sort of fan shaped water um, that comes out of one of these vase-like forms. So from this fountain spilling down into this long walkway that I just discussed was, um, or is this, which is called the 100 fountains. There's actually 300 spouts, um, but it's called the 100 fountains. And this is a series of three canals that are sort of stepped down the side. Um, and it's a series of water play. There's, um, lilies um, on the top. So water that comes out in the shape of lily and that alternates with water that's being sort of spit from an eagle. There's um, these faces that run along um, one row of the canal and it shows these sort of biomorphic masks. Um, this is the middle and the low canal. Um, and each mask is decorated with fish, with birds, with sea monsters, and they are spitting the water out into the lower canal. And in the lower canal, you have more fountains that are, um, again, fan-shaped like this. This is the fountain of the organ or the fountain of Neptune. And this um, is a really interesting water feature. Um, there were other musical fountains that had been um, built in gardens leading up to this, but this was really unique in that the water, um, it wasn't water pressure, but it was actually a, a process that separated air from water that allowed this to play. So the water was sent through um, a tank and kind of made purposefully into really um, swift whirlpools. And those the whirling water was sent down through a vertical tube to crash really violently on rocks below that vertical tube. And the process of the water crashing at such force um, in this like watertight tube 
allowed the water and the air to actually separate from each other. So the water went over a water wheel um, and the water wheel pushed cylinders and the cylinders allowed the different pipes of the organ to open up. And then the air that was separated from the water was sent up the pipes to actually play the music. Um, and I wanna just play a quick clip of um, this organ actually playing so that you can hear, hear what it sounds. It plays, um, four separate um, songs. The songs play for about four minutes and then the whole system resets itself and then it starts up again. Um, it's still, that that's obviously a recent video. It still plays today, um, but it's a pretty amazing feat that it's played by the separation of water from air um, just through force of the fountains. So these are some views looking at that fountain again. and the pipes. And so standing on top of the fountain of the organ or above the fountain of the organ, this is the view of like the long axis of the garden looking towards the fish ponds. So these are actually on a transverse accent, uh, axis arranged with the idea of a big street of water. There's fan-shaped plumes of water that rise up really high and then kind of fall delicately down, um, creating these really spectacular rainbows in the sunlight. And um, you get this sense of the sort of perennial cycle of water, even though this isn't, it isn't cycling, it's all fed by gravity, but you really get the sense of the cycle of water as you watch the water sort of spill down the hillside. Um, and these um, originally were basically fish tanks where fish were raised and um, held and then harvested for food for the Cardinal and his guests for dinner parties. The Fountain of the Dragon, this is another one with some pretty amazing sound effects. Um, it has really strong jets and the water changes dramatically. Um, it has this, it's meant to be scary. It has this sort of almost like military attack sound with the, with the water coming out with such force. And these are just some views through the garden to kind of highlight the symmetry. Again, this idea of the green and the stone um, being accented by container gardens, which is similar to the Villalante and Villa Terrace, as we know. At the end of the garden, the sort of symbolic end of the water course is the fountain of Rometa. Um, and this is sort of a, a ancient Rome fountain. It kind of tells the story of some gods and goddesses and some of the fights and some of the wars in ancient Rome. Um, and it's this, like I said, this sort of the symbolic edge of the garden. And from that garden, you can see um, the edge uh, kind of looking back down to Tivoli. And like I said, the edge is really quite defined in this garden, but the views in contrast to the uh, medieval gardens, the views are really allowed or invited into the garden. And there is this sort of negotiation, but we're not to the point of letting the actual nature into the garden yet, um, but allowing the views in and kind of this idea of worldliness and telling these stories of the past, the present and the future. And this is looking another direction. Um, I like this image because um, we'll see in just about one or two slides, the really dramatic elevation change in this garden. And I think that this, um, this kind of shows the extreme height difference from the terraces, which are adjacent to the villa down through the garden. So this is a plan, kind of a simple, 
simple stylized plan, which shows the symmetry of the garden. It shows the huge amounts of water in the garden, um, the kind of structure that the green actually provides. Um, and in this image, the, the white outlines to the left are actually the villa up on the hillside. And so the, the, the view that we just saw kind of looking up at the hilla or look, standing up on the villa, looking out towards Tivoli over across the cypress groves is looking kind of, um, you know, left to right across your screen. And then a section view of the garden showing the villa on the hillside and the various levels of patios which overlook the garden, um, which is pretty grand before you even get to the garden and the water features. But the, um, the actual level of the first terrace from the villa to the lowest point in the garden is 150 feet. So this garden has a very dramatic change in elevation as you go, um, as you kind of travel through the spaces in the garden. So from one of the most, or probably the most opulent or, you know, kind of larger than life garden of the Italian Renaissance, we'll go to Villa Lante, which is, um, sort of the, the garden that's thought to be the ultimate search for symmetry and kind of divine perfection in, in an Italian Renaissance garden. <clears throat> this was also home to a Cardinal, um, Giovanni Francesco Gambara. And this is located in the city of Benyeye, which is um, just outside of Viterbo. So we're still in that sort of same, same region. Um, within, you know, in, in modern travel within an hour of Rome, more or less. Um, so this garden is really kind of the ultimate in axial planning and elusive iconography. There's um, a great show of these humanist learning um, ideas and they're, they're really exemplified and really sort of perfected in this garden. And this, like the Villa d'Este, is not meant to be viewed all at once. Of course, you have a view from the top of the garden down to the end, but there's the sequence or the route that you travel through the garden, uncovering all of these sort of secret nooks and crannies along the way. Um, and so just this ultimate kind of perfection or divine harmony, um, really like looking towards the order in the universe to, to, to develop this design. And when this garden was started in 1566, um, the architect who was hired came to this site. And at that time there was just a small hunting lodge and you can see the villa garden on the left and then the sort of grounds on the right. This was hunting grounds for the Cardinal and then the small building in the center. That was the only thing that was on the site at the time um, when the garden was begun. And this plan, um, you really can see it or understand it as the kind of counterpoint of circles and squares. There's a single axis, much more than the Villa d'Este, which was there were axes kind of in multiple directions and, and the traveling was happening in multiple directions. This one has a very clear kind of single axis, which is similar to what we see at Villa Terrace. Um, it follows the slope of the land from the north to the south. Um, as a bit of trickery, the axis from the very beginning to the very end is always held by a line of water, but you can only really travel this line of water visually um, kind of physically, you always have to be beside it. You don't cross the water. Um, it's kind of similar to Villa Terrace where we, we can travel next to our water. We can travel kind of, you know, visually with our water, but we can't travel physically with the water. Um, this one has about 50 foot elevation change. So one third of the change at Villa Deste, not nearly as dramatic, but um, really kind of perfected. This is a long quote, um, and I will just share the highlight of it, but um, Pope Gregory VIII visited this, and he was just blown away by this garden, and he traveled with a person who chronicled all of his adventures, and um, this was their description or their writing of what they found at the garden. 
And I think what's interesting is that it says, but what makes it most noteworthy is the fountain, one of the loveliest in all of Europe. At first glance, it's not a single fountain, but a thousand. And first of all, a hill covered in crystal created by a great waterfall that descends from its peak. So this is um, truly a water garden um, covering the hillside in crystal, but different than the sort of really exuberant fountains that we just witnessed at Villa d'Este. Like Villa d'Este, there is a grotto at the top of the garden when you sort of begin your travel through the garden, um, which looks, you know, has this much more naturalized, kind of rough, mossy sort of look. And this is, just like Villa d'Este, the source of the water. Um, this is the start of the kind of compositional theme of the garden. Um, and also as this is fed, <clears throat> fed by gravity as well, this is the start of that sort of, you know, line of gravity before the water spills down, spills down the hillside. So this grotto is called the Fountain of the Flood. <clears throat> and you can see the kind of purposeful growth and this sort of kind of mystical beginning of the garden before the water is kind of harnessed and um, you know put into these really kind of perfect symmetrical water features. When you walk out of the grotto on the top, there's um, a sort of a grove of London plane trees, some evergreen oaks, a small bosque of fir trees. And this is the, um, the transition between the sort of rough grotto into the designed experience at Villa um, Deste that we just saw, the grotto kind of spilled over this huge fountain and then that was it. There was no um, transition or no kind of psychological space to make that, um, make that move from the source of nature to the designed um, portion of man. So the fountain of the floods, the grotto, feeds into um, the fountain of the dolphins. This is surrounded by really clipped boxed hedges, um, boxwood hedges, the curved benches, um, et cetera, like we have at Villa Terrace also seen here, and making this kind of outdoor alcove or these kind of outdoor rooms. Um, so this is dolphins, masks, different forms, um, different relief forms. From there, the water goes um, quickly, it kind of gushes forth into the fountain of the chain. This is a water staircase, similar to Villa Terrace. Um, the water sprays from the mouth of a stone crayfish and then kind of just, you know, travels down the slope and it leaps around with the way that the edges are scalloped, creating this sort of crystalline chain. From the edge of the crystalline chain, it rushes into the Fountain of the Giants. There's two large stone statues, um, and these depict the Tiber River and the Arno River, um, kind of symbolizing the idea of um, Rome and the papacy and the Medici family, these are symbols of those two families also in this kind of coming together or finding of common ground. Similar to the um, story that we saw of the Anyene River at Villa d'Este, the idea of the river or the water source continues throughout the garden. The water spills again from a shell that's held by a giant crayfish at the top and cascades through these different kind of um, half circular pools and then continues um, its water source here. It dips below the ground. It's hidden for just a moment and then comes up into this um, fountain here, which is called the Cardinal's Table. This um, is actually or was actually used as a dining table. So there's a long pool in the middle where um, dishes could be kept cool and then wide edges for setting the food. So the, um, this is where the dinner parties would happen in this garden. And the end of the Cardinal's table is this, the face that's kind of spitting or passing the water forth. And this is just looking back up along that really pretty perfect axis in the middle. 
from the Cardinals table, um, the water spills down into the fountain of the lamps. This is um, some concentric bases that are partially sunken into the ground, a really nice kind of secret spot of the garden. Um, it's six levels with about 70, 70 jets. This is looking a little bit closer at that. And from the fountain of the lamps, the water um, again dips underground in a canal to resurface at the end in these four enormous pools, the quadrato, um, this kind of this large square parterre that's divided up into um, 16 parterres, further divided into um, these really kind of ornate clipped um, decorative gardens. There's boxwood and um, yew, Texas, large planters of citrus in the middle. And the, the path of the garden divides this into four pools. Um, this is kind of a looking back at Moorish gardens where there were the four, the four rivers um, and the, the earth was divided into four quadrants. So this is kind of a, an allusion to the gardens that came before with the idea of the quadrants of the earth. Um, this kind of really, you know, perfect, beautiful, symmetrical um, garden scene at the end. Each of the pools has a boat that has people on the boat and they're blowing water through their trumpets. And the center statue at the middle. Closer look at that. And so this is the view down the axis. There were a lot of pieces from um, once the water came out of the grotto and started its kind of traveling down this axis, but you can see from here that it's actually seems like quite a compressed view. So this idea that you can see from, you know, the sort of your vantage point to the horizon, but then the actual traversing through the garden is so um, unique and so varied as you go. What's interesting about um, this garden, if you remember back to the first image, there was the very kind of symmetrical detailed, you know, super planned garden on the left, and then the park grounds on the right. This was originally um, hunting ground. And so there is a large park that surrounds this um, that has some isolated buildings and scattered fountains throughout. And this um, is an image of one of the fountains within that park. This is the Conservone, which is um, the water tank. So the water, it wasn't, um, the nearby rivers weren't gushing forth as heartily as uh, the Anyene River to feed Villa d'Este. So water was actually collected and stored here and then released to allow the fountains to flow. Um, and this was also a fishery. So the fish were, were um, bred and stocked here and then harvested for Cardinal's dinners as well, just like with Villa d'Este. But these are kind of, um, you know, just some views into the park. So this pretty stark contrast to the, um, the design of the garden. But these scattered, um, fountains that are found throughout the park are still each kind of a, a perfect geometry. They hint at this sort of divine order that people were seeking at the time. And so again, a simplified plan of what this garden looks like. You can see the water that begins um, at the top at the grotto and goes all the way down to the quadrato at the end, um, a continuous, one continuous axis of water, which defines sort of the, the garden from start to finish and the symmetry always folds along that water axis. And then a more simplified um, elevation change, 52 feet, as opposed to what we just saw, 150 feet. Um, you can still see the kind of detail of the steps and the terracing and the levels. And so then looking at Villa Terrace as a, you know, contemporary take on um, Renaissance garden design, um, 
very similar, I guess, in idea that there is the villa house with terraces that are built into the hillside with a view out towards a pretty expansive nature, the view out towards Lake Michigan. Um, a strong symmetry in this garden as well. Um, this was originally designed by landscape architect Rose Standish Nichols and then um, reimagined by another landscape architect, Dennis um, Bittner, through the efforts of the Friends of the Villa Terrace. And this reopened in 2002 through those efforts. And so the plan that we have here is Dennis Bittner's um, reimagining of the Rose Standish Nichols garden. And so like um, all of the gardens that we've seen, there are there's sort of a way that you travel through this garden. Um, this, of course, is the, the, the way that we enter into the garden through the Mercury courtyard. Uh, courtyard. <clears throat> so this is dominated by the statue of Mercury, as we know, the messenger of the gods. There's the vaulted loggia that surrounds um, and this Tuscan architecture um, and the Tuscan windows. This statue was um, brought here in 1967, um, purchased and gifted from the Villa Terrace Garden Club. And the torso of the statue dates from the second century, um, which is pretty interesting. The parterre, this is really similar to what we just saw at Villa Lante, this clipped boxwood um, edge parterre, to the parterres with a variety of ground covers within. And the um, mosaic tile floor is stones that were gathered from the shore of Lake Michigan. Going through the house um, and entering onto the terraces and again, looking towards that kind of expansive view of nature and to the lake, um, we have the, um, you know, the various terraces that lead down, the Parnassus Terrace, um, the Nymphaeum or the Grotto Terrace, um, also the Moon Terrace on the top. And so similar to Villa Deste and Villa Lante, there's statues that are hidden throughout this garden. They contribute to the sense of mystery and the sense of theater within the garden. Um, these are the puti, the small babies um, that represent four seasons. They also represent um, arts like music, painting, um, theater, and architecture. Going down um, just below to the next terrace, the Grotto Terrace, the Nymphaeum Terrace, this is the source, the water source of the, our water at the Villa Terrace. Like the other gardens that we just saw, it begins in a grotto. Um, this one is not as rough or you know, mountainous looking. Um, the, it doesn't have the same growth of vegetation, but similar in idea that there is a grotto and there is a source fountain that sort of feeds the life of the garden. There's a small lead dolphin on the wall um, and that's sort of the water source and then the nymphs look on. And this water from the mouth of the fountain spills down into our, um, our water stairway. Um, the, it's the Scalita de Aqua is the proper name, the stairway of water. Um, this originally utilized water that was pumped from Lake Michigan, similar to the gardens that we just saw. It's utilizing the source. This time it was pumps, it wasn't necessarily gravity, but bringing the water up and then letting it kind of spill down, kind of completing that idea of the cycle of water. Um, now this is um, on a tap. It's not sourced from directly from the lake, I guess indirectly from the lake, um, but kind of the same idea. So from the dolphin, we have the water that flows down with this kind of really regular, but really nice force down the water stairway. Um, and um, like I just mentioned with the Villa Lante, we don't actually travel next to this water. We travel kind of visually with the water, but we're always, um, we always are somehow beside it, not, not crossing it. And this um, image is pre the reconstruction of the garden. And um, what I like about this in image is that it shows how the space beside the water changed. This was before the, um, the orchard, which is now sort of 
hugging really close to the edge of the water stairs um, in the current conditions. So the orchard, like I said, it, it goes kind of inhabits the slope on the side of the water um, stairs. This was, I think, specifically in reference to Boboli Gardens in Florence and their orchards. Um, but this is planted with four types of crabapple trees that stepped on the orchard. Um, these beautiful displays of pink and white blossoms in the spring and really amazing color in the fall and the fruits that persist into the winter. Um, we also know this as um, the bride's orchard. And you can see when the colors really, really come to life. So this is looking back up the water stairs and at the very um, bottom with the lion's face, we get a view of um, the Vasca, which is the sort of end of the water sequence. This anchors the cascade of terraces and water stairs into a semi-circular pool. Um, this is similar to the fish ponds at Villa d'Este and the Conservone at Villa Lante. Um, live fish are kept here. They're not harvested for food for dinner parties, but this is where they live. There are um, three lead fishes within the Vasca that represent the rivers that define Milwaukee, the Menominee, the Knicknick, and the Milwaukee River. So just like Villa d'Este and Villa Lante, there is this um, the theme, the recurring theme of the source of the water, the local water um, in all three gardens, there's really strong ties specifically to the rivers that feed them or provide sort of the life source from the areas around. The gardens bordered to the north or south by double alleys of Armstrong maple trees, which are underplanted with these really nice um, thickets of Arctic willow and Annabelle hydrangea. The um, south alley here, looking kind of back up towards the garden, and then a view of the north alley, which has this the restroom building tucked kind of gracefully into the garden. Oops, and then. Um, Ceres, who um, sits in the South LA, the Roman goddess of agriculture, or uh, she represents um, the fall season, the harvest of grain. She has a permanent house on the southern, within the southern LA. Um, and both LA's are terminated with these small um, Giardino Sigratos, which are small secret gardens. Um, at, at the kind of end of the lay, there's these hidden gardens and like the Villa Lante and the Villa d'Este, there's, um, you know, these statuaries and these stories that are hidden within. And even though you can see the garden from the, from the moon terrace, you can see all the way down to like Michigan, you can't actually see into these secret rooms until you are in them. Um, and so Diana and Hercules occupy these rooms at the end. Um, the Prato, the large lawn, um, has the, this obelisk in the center, which is surrounded by ever-changing gene annuals, um, which brings nice color and kind of harkens back to the, the seasonality and the sort of fruitfulness and abundance of the Italian Renaissance gardens. And of course, this view that we all know, looking back up along that, um, beautiful axis, so taking in the obelisk, taking in the water stairs, the grotto, the terraces, and then the villa itself. And another earlier view before the sort of trimming and shaping of the garden that we see today, um, but still showing that really nice expansive lawn and the highlighting of that axis. So the arch thicket of musselwood trees at the southern, sorry, the eastern end of the garden, um, this sort of frames the north and south axis. Um, this is called the boschetto. And looking in either direction through the boschetto, you can see the curved benches, this small nook, the et cetera, that sits within the LA. Um, this is really similar to the etc. that was at the Villa Lante at the top, um, the curved benches and that sort of alcove carved out of the 
the um, the bosk in that garden. And then the other entrance um, would be the, the Neptune gate at the end. This is a contemporarily made gate um, looking at, you know, or taking some of these images of water, these, these allegories, the story of Neptune with his trident. There's scroll work S's for the Smith family, the original garden owners, um, but a contemporary sort of end or closure to the garden. And this is that long view. Again, we, you know, having, you know, if you've had the um, joy of walking through the garden, starting at the terrace all the way down to the gate, you know what a long walk that is, and you know all of the things that you discover on the way. But you can see that that the idea of perspective and that really sort of compressed view that looks like one thing, but then sort of unfolds differently as you travel through it and as you are in it. And this is the um, kind of plan of the garden um, more simply laid out. You can see the water axis, you can see the green and the structure and the symmetry um, and how the garden sort of can fold in on itself along that line of water, very similar to Villa Lante. And like the last two gardens that we looked at, um, the dramatic change in elevation from villa to the bottom of the garden here, uh, it's about 69 feet that you would travel from um, the actual first top terrace, moon terrace of the villa down to the Neptune gate. And so as an overview, these are the three garden plans that we just looked at. I think the um, the idea of symmetry, the, you know, the really strong axes of water, the really kind of rigid structure, this um, kind of finding the divine order in nature and then building it for the first time. It can really be seen in the plan views of Villa d'Este and Villa Lante. And then this contemporary take on those same ideas at the Villa Terrace. Um, and then another view of the sections. Um, it's interesting to see how the gardens, um, Villa d'Este of course is really kind of grand and over the top, um, but being in the gardens, you get similar feelings and similar, um, you know, there's the similar sort of psychological dimension of the small spaces within the gardens. Um, and even though you're changing quite a bit of elevation, there's still, um, like an intimacy in the garden at, you know, that's kind of folded into this, this grandeur that we see. And so um, with that, I'll leave you with these images of these um, profiles in the three gardens. And um, thank you so much for listening. And I guess if there's any questions, I'll do my best to um, answer them. Thank you, Jennifer. That was really great. Um, maybe we can switch the view to gallery. Um, I think you have to shut off your um, presentation. Great. And if anyone has any questions, um, please uh, unmute yourself and chime in. Hi, Jennifer. This is Moira. I have a question about the rivers. Can you talk again about the three rivers and that significance, where it is in the in the gardens? Thank you. The, um, in the Villa d'Este, the water is harnessed from the river Anyene, and it's brought um, from it's that's kind of the river that's uh, I think it's about a mile that the water actually travels in an underground canal, and that is the source of that fountain. Um, and it's the source of, you know, much of the life um, provides most of the water to Tivoli and to the farms that surround that. And so um, there is some of the, um, the Italian or the Renaissance garden scholars believe that certain um, fountains within that garden speak to that river. It's, especially because that, unlike a lot of the other gardens, the fountains are really um, 
tumultuous. Like they're, they're loud, they spill, they make noise, they spray. Um, they're not calm by any means, which speaks to or reflects the source water as being similar. In Villa Lante, the water isn't collected from a specific river, but it's just kind of collected from the runoff in the hills and it's held in the Cantavone, the, um, the, that kind of big fish tank that's off into the park. But there are, um, there are discussions or there are um, allusions to the two, two important rivers in the area, in the area, the, um, the Tiber and the Annan River. And those, that's actually um, the last image that I just showed that had the one kind of giant sculptural man leaning over the river. The, um, that fountain particularly is sort of the joining of those two rivers and the life-giving force of those two rivers coming together, spilling out of the crayfish, joining those two rivers. Um, and in the Villa Terrace, the three, um, the three pieces that are in the Vasca are said to represent the three rivers that we know, like we sit at the confluence of the Menominee, the Kinnickinnick and the Milwaukee River. We know that that's a large reason why um, Native American settlements were here because of the confluence of those rivers and sort of the richness that it brought to the land. And so these three water features um, kind of joined together to just pay tribute, I guess, to those three rivers. So in each case, it's about um, the sort of life force or life source that the water provides. Thank you. Jennifer? Yes. Have you, have you seen these Italian gardens? I assume because of the photographs you have. I have, yes. Um, You're so lucky. Yes, Villa Lante is probably my most favorite garden that I've ever seen. It's absolutely stunning. It looks so, um, it's so quiet and it's, it doesn't come at you with any sort of force, but it's just, it's unbelievably majestic. And I think that some of the images, you know, they're, they're a bit artsy and they're catching, you know, a unique feature, but when you really kind of have time to look at the plan and see how perfectly it is laid out and how it just takes this hillside and like, it doesn't, it doesn't worry about the irregularity of the hillside. It just carves it so beautifully. Um, and it's just, it's spectacular in its execution. It really, really is. There's another garden close by, which follows on the tail of this garden called um, Bomarzo or Paco de Mostri. And it's um, a garden that's filled with huge kind of grotesque, really macabre statues throughout. Um, and it was another that was built by a cardinal. Um, and then he died and the this construction ended um, and it was all covered with moss. And I think 300 years later, a family purchased the land and just was kind of digging in the garden and started uncovering these monsters. And there's like the statue of Hercules there is 40 feet tall and kind of huge and scary. And that's, um, that's the other garden that kind of follows on the heels after the Renaissance. There's this brief period um, of mannerism um, which we know if you study art history or you you know about art history you learn about mannerism and that's like the only surviving garden of that time but it has this these kind of grotesque things that in these gardens we just see in the grottos like the grottos are kind of rough and you know not super refined and they're seen as the source and then um, you know the human takes that source and refines it into these sort of perfect spaces but then at the uh, Bomarzo that's there was none of that refinement and none of that perfection it was just all kind of crazy and so um, that's also within about an hour or two of Rome. So these all could be seen in a long weekend. Once wow. We <laughs> wow, you're lucky. It looks like Virginia Small has put a virtual hand up. So I don't know so, if you would like to. Yeah. So thank you. Yes, that was, this was fascinating. 
So I wonder if you know much about how it was that Rose Stan, Standish Nichols, um, uh, how she came to be uh, attracted to Italian gardens. And I, I know she wrote a book about them, right? So she, um, what, 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 what kind of relationship um, did she have with Italian gardens and then how she came to be involved with, with uh, Villa Terrace? I don't know if you know any of that, but. I mean, I know little. I feel like Virginia, you probably, you might know more than me about Rose Standish Nichols, but we know she was a female landscape architect from Boston um, who studied in Europe and did a long tour in Italian gardens. She did write a book on Italian gardens. There was a specific garden that has very little documentation, which she said was her kind of number one um, inspiration for the Villa Terrace. Um, it wasn't one that I covered because like I said, I haven't been, it has very little documentation. I would not have much to share about it. Um, she wrote about other garden types as well. I believe that she wrote a book about English pleasure gardens. Um, so I think she just, you know, she had the fortune of spending a year traveling and learning about all of these different types of um, gardens. And she worked in um, the Midwest in Chicago with um, Adler and some of the, you know, kind of prominent architects of those big manor houses in the Chicago North Shore. Um, and so she was connected with them and did a lot of garden designs, not all of them Italian in inspiration, but she did a lot of garden designs for these really, you know, amazing homes that were built at the turn of the century, around the turn of the century. Um, and that's how she, you know, got this commission. I'm not sure, you know, the architecture obviously inf influenced heavily the garden type that we have at Villa Terrace. Um, it was purposefully not an English pleasure garden or any of the other, you know, garden types that she had studied. Um, I don't know much more beyond that. There's a book, um, which is called, um, there's a series of architectural reference books that were written. Um, and there's one that's specifically about the manor houses of Chicago's North Shore. And some of her gardens are in that. There is uh, a written reference to Villa Terrace. There aren't any images in that that I could find, um, but it just talks about sort of all the homes that were being built um, and mentions her connection to the architects there. Beyond that, I don't, I don't know much more about her. I mean, there's, other than that, she was a female landscape architect and she, she worked really on these kind of, you know, big villa gardens or big manor, gar manor gardens. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm thinking after being um, dragged through many, many gardens in China when I was there, um, I'm super grateful to just walk through them virtually with you because mm -hmm. these are kind of a long hike. I was um, looking up the Tivoli one. It looks like it's almost five times as big as Villa Terrace. So uh, how much of a day do you have to spend to um, see everything? And then how big is the other garden relative to Villa Terrace? So Villa Deste is, I think it's about 35 acres. Wow. So it's massive. And what's interesting about that is that it's all the designed garden. There isn't the park, like with Villa Lante, the actual designed garden itself is probably about two. So not that much larger in actual like, you know, land area or, or probably pretty similar to Villa Terrace in land area, but then the park that surrounds it is much larger. Um, but it's actually, it's one of the smallest of these Villa gardens. Um, and I think partially that's because it doesn't, it's not actually associated with the house. It was hunting grounds, so it's sort of like the the weekend <laughs> the weekend place, I guess. So it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a place where um, 
the cardinal and whoever he, whoever was in his you know in his crew at the time they didn't spend a bunch of time there it was a place that was only visited every so often um and it seems like that was designed as sort of um an experiment within the larger park um but villa deste was that was all in like that was the year round residence Typically, um, Tivoli was like a summer residence for people in, or summer, like the summer spot for people in Rome, but the Cardinal was there all year round for the, I think it was 22 years um, that he was there, kind of continually working and building that. So that, that acreage was nearly every inch kind of designed, platted, you know, the symmetry, the, all of the work that goes into Villa Terrace that we know, but at that greatly expanded scale. But you could still see it in a day. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if, if there are no other questions, um, once again, I'd like to thank our speaker, Jennifer. Um, that was fascinating. Um, also want to thank our sponsors, Angela Westmore and Susan Strecker. And uh, hope everybody can make the last of our garden lectures, um, which, which, is, which will be coming up. Um, we'll have um, Suzanne Staubach uh, presenting a garden miscellany in a week. So thanks everyone for attending and um, good night. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank Thanks. That was great. Yeah, it was really well good. Done. I we loved it. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank well you. done. Bravissimo. Yeah. <laughs> Bravo. Thanks. Bravo. Bravo.